All right, well, I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, I never know when I give these talks on JOHD how many people we're gonna get in the room because within Huntington's disease, this is a very small group of individuals, right? But very impacted and it's super important to be addressing JOHD individually. So I'm a neurologist and I'm at UC Davis in Sacramento. We have a large center of excellence there. We see over 300 um, uh, patients and families per year in our clinic and we've seen about 20 to 25 JOHD patients over um, my decade of doing this. So we have actually a fairly large um, group of individuals affected by JOHD. All right. So my goal, this is the disclosure, um, which I don't have any. So my goal today, I'm gonna to start with this slide, is to talk about what JOHD is, introduce it to you, how we go from adult onset to juvenile onset, what symptoms are unique to JOHD, because even though it's the same disease, it's a different beast as I think about it, okay? And so we need to appreciate the unique characteristics of this and how we uniquely treat it, because it's not treated the same way. We don't use the same medications. The education around this is not the same, right? So we need to individualize this for our JOHD patients and their families. So this is what navigating the world of HD and JOHD feels like, a minefield. You're constantly adjusting how you're approaching it. And I wanna help you approach this and give you knowledge that you can bring back to your families, to your care providers, so that you're equipped with knowing what the landscape of managing this is. So you might see this, but what I see out there is this, and this is all of you. You are the HD warriors that are navigating this landscape and the minefield that this is. So the knowledge I give to you today is what you can put in your tool book to turn around and feel like this. You can't do it alone. This is not a place where you can do everything and do it alone. That's why we're here, it's the community. It's learning from other people. It's leaning on other people when your legs feel wobbly. It's having someone help you navigate this. And this is a unique community where the clinicians, the researchers, and the community come together to move the field forward in terms of understanding Huntington's disease, juvenile onset Huntington's disease, and getting closer to disease modifying and potentially curative treatment modalities, as we just heard in the wonderful research forum. So what is juvenile onset? Well, just like adult onset, it's a genetically inherited, I call it a neuropsychiatric neurodegenerative disease. It's caused by the abnormal CAG repeat expansion on the HD gene, which leads to the mutant Huntington protein, which leads to the disease within the brain and what we see on the outside. And just like adult onset, you're at 50-50 chance of getting it. So the most, the mean age of onset is 40, right, in your 40s. That's adult onset. But what we're talking about is this group, right? Way over here in the corner, where you have onset before the age of 20, most classic phenotype before the age of 10, and it's associated with these much higher CAG repeats. So this is a group that we're talking about. CAG repeats above 50 and age of onset below the age of 20. So how do we get there, right? How do you get from 40 to 60? It's a big jump. Well, we have these ranges down here where if you have greater than 39, so 40 and above, you will get Huntington's disease within your lifetime. If you have below 26, that's normal range, you will not get HD within your lifetime. And then we have the gray zone, as we call it, in between. And this talk is not meant to go over those in detail, so I won't, You've had, there's been many other talks about them, but the most important to know is above 39, you will get the disease. Now, when the gene comes from mom, it's a fairly stable gene. You tend to get around the same number mama has, plus or minus two. 
But when it comes through dad, it's a less stable gene. And that's where we see the vast majority of cases for juvenile onset Huntington's disease, is when the dad passes the gene on to the next generation. And then there can be this expansion. Not all cases are coming from dad. There are case reports of coming from mom, but the vast majority is coming down through dad. And how that happens is women are born with their set of of over the eggs, right? And we release an egg every month. And so it's a fairly stable process. We're not making new eggs. Whereas men are creating sperm all the time. And that's just a, a much less stable of a process and more prone for error. So that's where and why the vast majority of cases come through dad. So how does juvenile onset Huntington's disease affect our kiddos? I like to think about it in three main categories, memory, mood, and movement. Those are the three main categories that it affects, just like adults. But uniquely, you get these effects memory, uh, leads to changes in thinking, difficulty with movements, psychiatric behavioral disturbances, very different than typical onset HD, um, and particularly in children under the age of 10 who are affected by this disease. But it has its unique challenges. Typical initial symptoms, usually there is a family history, not always. Sometimes it's not known in the family, sometimes dad hasn't developed symptoms yet, and the kiddos want to develop symptoms first. Um, but usually we can see a family history, um, start to develop some stiffness in the legs, start to uh, feel a little clumsy, maybe dropping things, dropping balls, not throwing as steadily, um, decline in um, ability to think through and reason through things or learn new things. Um, you might see some changes in behaviors. Seizures are unique to this population. We do not see it in adult onset, but you can see it in uh, juvenile. Uh, changes in swallowing, that's the oral motor function. Um, chorea in kids that are a little bit older that develop this, so from 10 to 20, but it's, it's uniquely absent for the most part in JOHD, especially in kids that develop this before the age of 10. So um, doing a deeper dive into each of these categories. So uh, memory, we think about decline in cognitive function, that's thinking. Um, initially, it's very subtle and slowly progressive over time. They may appear at least at first in class or in the home a little distracted, uh, get overwhelmed easily with too much information coming at them or too many decisions, and have difficulty completing tasks. So they might have a harder time keeping up. Um, in school or learning new assignments in school. They might um, have start to lose milestones, so previously gained achievements, they might lose the ability to do those. Difficulty learning new skills, you start to see a decline potentially in school performance. Um, they have a hard time paying attention and concentrating. Um, as well as especially in larger kind of classroom set, uh, settings and problems with multitasking and decision making so carrying out things making decisions oops I think I skipped there we go in in movement or motor skills as I think about it you start to develop some clumbiness potentially some changes in speech difficulty riding a bicycle or throwing a ball and um, they start to get rigid, which is sort of this tight stiffness, um, and you can see it in their walking. They can develop dystonia, which is abnormal twisting or posturing of a body part or parts. So you get kind of this twisting posture, changes in walking or difficulty in walking, clumsiness, poor difficulty with um, oral motor control, so swallowing food, um, potentially even saliva. And like I said, chorea can be present, but it's rare. Um, and it's as you get closer to kind of that 20 cutoff. Mood and behavior is complex. These kiddos come from HD families, right? And we know the psychosocial impact that has on our young individuals. Um, so taking everything in context. So you start to see what we call psychiatric or behavioral changes. Depression, they might feel sad or tearful. Uh, feeling hopeless, changes in sleep patterns could be presenting this way, their appetite changes, their level of interest and energy, and overall um, performance declines, difficulty with attention, they might even be hyperactive, um, uh, hypersexuality, 
aggressiveness, impulsivity, and uh, explosive behavior, and this obsessive thinking. They get stuck on something and they can't let it go. Now, like I said, you have to know, is, is this the effect of the disease or the psychological distress of Huntington's disease or the disease? The mood and behavior piece of this is the least predictable. So we can kind of track motor change and um, decline. We can track memory change and decline. And we can actually kind of predictably track that over the years. Mood and behavior is the least predictable of these symptoms. Some people really have very little mood or behavioral disturbances. And some people have really extreme, really impactful behavior. So there's a whole spectrum here. And just because all these are mentioned as possibilities, it means they might have their own mixed bag of experiences. Um, you want to be mindful about substance use, and then this can cause very significant uh, disruptions for in the home with the family, as well as at school and in social networks. As I mentioned, seizures are unique to this patient population. You can see a whole wide spectrum of seizures, from absence uh, to focal to generalized seizures. So there's the whole spectrum. Um, and it's mentioned in about 38% of individuals with JOHD experience seizures. Um, but please note that babies and children can have seizures and have primary seizure disorders in themselves. So seizures in isolation by itself does not mean JOHD. It means this is a symptom associated with it. And when you're thinking about JOHD and you're looking at your, your, your children and wondering, is this JOHD, you have to put it all together. And we'll talk about the importance of taking a journey through an evaluation of a kiddo with JOHD, since the vast majority of HD patients are adult onset. So there's this term young adult, um, um, young onset adult Huntington's disease. And this is a young adult with, which appear to have features of both, of JOHD and adult onset HD. And nobody fits perfectly into one box ever, let alone perfectly in these boxes per, per se. So you want to pay special attention to the individual's journey, experience, and their needs. And you can be both part of each world. You can be part of both worlds, OK? Sorry, this thing is kind of finicky. So there are challenges in diagnosing JOHD, and it is a journey. It's not a one and done. We're testing your blood, and we're, we're checking to see if this is JOHD. So many of these symptoms can be found in other syndromes or diseases, right? ADHD, seizures psychosocial stress of coming from an HD family. There's lots of things that can be due to other things. So you have to take a step back and understand, is, has it been a slowly progressive presentation? Does it meet all these criteria of these three categories? And do I suspect that this is going to be JOHD? So you want to take a journey through the diagnosis. HD genetic testing does not necessarily the, mean the symptoms are due to JOHD either. You, again, I have to put them all together. And you, sometimes you're faced or challenged with a complicated family history. Families are complicated, period. We all have one. We know that, right? Um, so it could be that the parent's not yet affected, as I mentioned before. Maybe dad has 40 repeats, but the kiddo inherited 60, and they present before the age of 10, and dad hasn't reached the age in which he's symptomatic yet. So it could be that the parent's not affected yet and the family history is not clear um, above dad. Uh, there could be an early death of a parent, potentially a motor vehicle accident, um, something that took them from our world before they were able to present with symptoms. Um, misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis, maybe there's a psychiatric feature, you know, history, someone was diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, and it was misdiagnosed. So we might have um, potentially a misdiagnosis in the family. There's non-paternity issues. Dad might not be dad, OK? And we have um, kiddos that are adopted. And we don't know um, what the family history is. 
So you have to know where to turn, right? And that's why people attend these conferences and, and learn where are my resources? Where do I go to get evaluated? How should I go about getting an evaluation? Don't just go to the primary care physician and get a blood test because you might test a child for JOHD and what if you find out that the nine-year-old has ADHD but has 40 repeats? What do you do? You know, how does that kiddo ever get to kind of make their own choice, you know, make their own choices and live, live their, their determined life, right? So only 10 to 15% or even fewer, depending on where you look, of people at risk for HD choose to get predictive genetic testing. So you have to be careful about making this choice for a child and taking that choice away from them, unless it's really implicated because of what they're experiencing. So, evaluation for possible JOHD. Talk to your healthcare provider, seek a referral to a center that is equipped to see and take you through this journey. Not every Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence actually sees kiddos. Some, some don't because they don't have the experience, some don't because their institution doesn't allow them to as adult pract practitioners. So, find a center, and actually we're, as part of the uh, HSG, uh, uh, JOHD working group, we're trying to actually pull together a list. Um, actually, just emails went out this last week. Thank you for filling that out. Um, uh, so we're trying to pull together a list of centers that see kiddos so that we can equip all of you with centers that can see your, your young ones. Um, what to expect? We're going to obtain a medical and a neurological history. We're going to get your family history in depth. We're going to try to understand your developmental history. How were you growing up, right? What milestones have you achieved? When did you walk? When did you talk? When did you roll? Are you in regular classes? How are you doing in your classes? Just to understand how, how that trajectory has gone because we might see that it changes over, over time. We'll do an in-depth neurological exam, see if we can see any what we call objective findings that would be consistent with juvenile onset Huntington's disease. See how your eyes move, see how your fingers move, see how you walk, see if there's any additional movements that we can see. Um, we're going to have a discussion um, about the impression and plan, like impression meaning what are we thinking, and plan what are we going to do about it, right? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Empower yourself with that. If you don't understand what someone is saying, ask them to say it differently. Sometimes medical providers talk goobly goop, right? We use language that what is not consistent with normal conversation, okay? If you don't understand a word, ask. It is okay. This is your time, your space. You're here for you and your loved one. So empower yourself with that. Be that HD warrior you already are. A diagnosis of a JHD takes time. It might not be that first visit where we say, oh, okay, this, this looks like, sounds like JOHD, let's, let's check your blood. They might say, it may or may not be. I'm not seeing anything on your exam or maybe something subtle. Let's bring you back. Let's bring you back in three months or six months and let's watch this over a little bit of time, okay? You don't have to commit to is it or is it not right away. And then make sure um, that you have routine follow-up so that you know when you're gonna see this provider again. So do we test or do we not test? Well, if the history and exam are strongly suggestive of JOHD, then, you can, then we proceed with what we call confirmatory testing, is we're diagnosing it clinically. Now I'm gonna confirm that with a genetic diagnosis, all right? But if symptoms are not typical and exam is not clear, then you should not pursue genetic testing at that time. This is where you give it time. And the goal, the shared goal, is to make an appropriate and timely diagnosis but avoid potential risks of testing a child inappropriately or prematurely, okay? That's our shared goal. We're not hedging, we're just trying to do the right thing for you and your family. So what are the potential risks of premature genetic testing? Well, we attribute symptoms to HD that's not. You know, like I said, maybe they have ADHD in isolation. Maybe they have seizures in isolation. We had a patient who is six years old 
and the family came to us in crisis because the six-year-old was seeing a, um, a neurologist in the community for seizures and had really bad seizures, hard to control seizures. And, then, and the neurologist found out that this six-year-old's grandfather had recently been diagnosed with Huntington's disease in his 60s, mind you, okay? And so the mom and the neurologist decide to test her to see if these seizures are due to JOHD. And what happens? She has 40 repeats. So we just outed her for an adult onset disease that she might not get until she's in her 60s. So they came to end. What else happened? Her dad had not tested yet. So they tested the dad inadvertently and diagnosed him before he showed symptoms with HD. And they came to us like, what should, what should we do? Well, we're too far down and ahead of that cart, so let's just talk through the different scenarios. How do you counsel someone like this? I don't know. I don't have the perfect answer, but we talked about secrets never go well in families, but how and when you tell her is going to be a very difficult decision. Is it as she's applying for college? Is it after she goes to college or doesn't, you know, goes to trade school or whatever these decisions she makes? There's no right answer, but that's a really hard thing to undo once it's done. So that's why we're very careful. Um, you know, stigma around premature genetic testing or genetic test results, insurance, employment, psychological effects on the child, and social effects on the child. So again, there's implications to this. So what do you want to do um, with a diagnosis of JOHC? You want to bring together your medical team. Um, this is our fabulous medical team here. We have neurologists, psychiatrists, social worker, genetic counselor. We have therapists, physical therapists. Some people have speech um, and occupational therapy. We have our research coordinators that get people involved in research if that's important to them. Um, we want to make sure that they're in engaged in therapy. Um, I call it PT, SDOT. Everybody benefits from all three of those. Uh, we want a dietitian on board if nutritional needs are, are a question. We want to align our efforts and, and build a relationship with the primary care physician so we can help them understand JOHD and the unique um, care and needs um, for that patient and make sure that they have a dentist too. So we want to make sure we have all their people in place to care for them. For the medical care, each person has their own individual course with medical care tailored to their needs. There is no perfect algorithm for JOHD. I had a, a, woman, a palliative care physician from Nova Scotia call me one day or reach out to us on our Facebook page and ask, can I have a conversation with you? Um, I found your information by Googling JOHD and I found one of your talks on your website. And she had a patient on her service in the hospital um, with JOHD, um, fairly advanced, and she had never seen a JOHD patient before. And so she called me up and just said, how can I help this kiddo? And we spent two hours on the phone. So it's really learning from each other. I learn from everybody, these talks, I learn when we get together and teach each other about our things that we have learned, best practices. And I keep adding to that bucket all the time, right? Because there's no perfect al algorithm. So treatment focuses on education, like understanding this, right? I, what is JOHD? How is it gonna affect my loved one? What do I expect? What are my options for treatments? We focus on the movement disorder part of it. So we have ways to treat the different movements we have ways to kind of manage the cognitive piece of this. We have treatments and behavioral management of the psychiatric and behavioral features. And we're going to talk about what um, the landscape of options are. We treat the seizures and we manage the psychosocial dynamics. There is a handbook that was written by Martha Nance some time ago. Um, and it's a really nice guide. You can get it through the HDSA and you could take it to your local neurologist if they're needing to learn about JOHD. Some of these tools are really good because you can help others learn. I often find that a lot of primary care physicians or what I call neurologists, the community neurologist, 
um, their heart's in a good place. They just haven't had the experience. And if they're willing to pair up and read the material that you give them, that's partly your empowerment to empower them. Give them a chance. So treatment of motor symptoms. We want to get in there early. We want to make sure that they are living in a safe um, environment and that they have safety devices and equipment to meet their needs as their disease progresses. And I'll share with you some of these, um, uh, some of the equipment that we found um, helpful over time. We want to get physical therapy and what we call range of motion exercises in place early. Because as these kiddos progress, they can become more rigid, more dystonic, stiffer, and the range of motion, that's your ability to extend and flex your arm, d diminishes over time and you start getting tight and stiff. We want to make sure that we're doing range of motion exercises. Again, safety measures and fall prevention. Um, so we have different medications for the rigidity or what we call spasticity. Dystonia, which is the, the um, abnormal twisting or posturing. I didn't mention this earlier. Myoclonus, um, which is this fast-like movement, and I'll show you a picture of it, and then Korean tics. So we'll share with you the different kind of ways we can treat each of these individual symptoms. So rigidity or spasticity is that tight, tightness or stiffness. At first, it's usually not uncomfortable or painful, but over time, as you can imagine, as you get tighter or stiffer, that becomes uncomfortable, and provides discomfort and uh, potentially pain. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're maintaining that range of motion. Some of these medications are listed here that we use. Carvedopa, levodopa, it's, uh, they call it their dopa pills, or Cinemet, is classically used for Parkinson's disease, slow, stiff, in Parkinson's disease, and we have found it of benefit in our JOHD patients, and it can provide some modest relief of that. Amantadine is also a medication that's used for many different things, um, but it's also used in Parkinson's disease, um, and that also can provide some relief with the, the stiffness. Uh, baclofen, which is a muscle relaxer, um, and then clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine and just kind of relaxes everything. Um, and sometimes our kiddos are on all four of these, okay? So they can be on one, two, or all of them. So we can use them together um, to provide relief over time. And this is kind of the order we tend to start them in, a little bit of cinnamet, folding in amantadine. These are kind of more stronger um, just in terms of their efficacy, but also have um, a stronger side effect profile. They can be a little sedating. Um, so uh, we use those kind of in the third and fourth, but it's not uncommon for our kiddos to be on all four. And I'm actually gonna show you a case of a more advanced um, JOHD patient and kind of their medication list and what that looks like. Um, other great therapies is Botox. You know, we think about it for our wrinkles on our face, right? Um, but it relaxes the, ner the communication between the nerve and the muscle. And that can release some of that tightness or stiffness. And we can use it very, what we call focally. So um, in the arm, and it's, you, you get it every three months, and then you don't have to take a medication per se. Um, and so we use Botox, and it can be very effective in our young kiddos. For the dystonia, um, uh, it can affect any body part. Um, it can be intermittent. It just comes and goes at first, and then it can become more what we call sustained. It's present um, maybe all day, every day, as opposed to coming and going. And this also can be associated with discomfort. Um, and a great therapeutic for is Botox, because it's usually of a body part or parts, so it's kind of more focal. It becomes more diffuse over time, but Botox is a great way to target this. We can also use the baclofen and clonazepam to help quiet it down, um, either together, um, uh, synergistically, um, or individually. Myoclonus, we all experience myoclonus when we're falling asleep and all of a sudden we get that quick sudden jerk, right? Some of you might be experiencing it right now um, as you're nodding off, but um, it, it's that kind of sleep start, right? Um, but it's what we call non-pathological. It's not a bad thing when we experience it. But in JOHD, it's what we call pathological. It's due to disease, okay? Um, a great, and the one medication that's available that quiets down clonazepam, or that quiets down uh, myoclonus is clonazepam. Now you can see that clonazepam is used for several different things. So oftentimes we're able to use a medication to kind of grab a set of symptoms um, and, and treat that constellation of symptoms. It's not 
each thing has its each own medication, but oftentimes we can minimize what we call polypharmacy or too many medications by targeting multiple symptoms with one medication. And that also kind of help when you look at the individual, you might choose baclofen or clonazepam over baclofen based on what the constellation of that unique individual's experiences are, right? So it's targeted therapy for the individual. Korea, as you all know, are those kind of uh, uh, irregular um, sort of dance-like movements that people experience kind of flowing from body part to body part. Um, and it can be non-bothersome or it can be either interfering with physical abilities um, or socially um, it's embarrassing for an individual. And so you can treat it for either one, whatever is important for the individual. Um, we have three FDA medications for Korea and Huntington's disease alone, which is fabulous, you know. We've had uh, tetrabenazine or xenazine for decades, and then a decade ago now, I guess, Osteto, no, five years, six years, something like that, yeah. Osteto came aboard, which has been great. There's now an extended release formulation, so you don't have to take it twice a day, but just once a day. And then just recently, um, in the last six months, valbenazine or Ingreza was um, approved for treatment of Korea in Huntington's disease. So we got three, which is great. Um, and then you can use what we call our neuroleptics or antipsychotics. It's a category of medication um, that's used to treat mood disorders across the spectrum of, of diseases. Um, but it's, they're great to use for treatment of Korea. And here's some of them listed. Zyprexa, Risperidone, Abilify, Haldol. Um, you might have heard of some or all. Um, there's different reasons for using each one depending on the individual. So we just have a landscape that we can use. And with this being a, uh, for mood and psychiatric um, conditions as well, we can treat two different things. So if someone is having more prominent mood or behavior changes, plus they're having chorea, we might choose one of these um, antipsychotics over um, these other medications, right? So again, we have to individualize it and look in, at the person. Ticks, those are fast movements, so they might be repeated or intermittent movements of a body part or parts, usually associated with a, a, an urge, like they feel like they have to do it, and then when they do it, it feels good, like the, the urge goes away until it comes back again. Um, they could be brief, they could be suppressible, meaning they can, someone can consciously override it and not have it happen. Um, they can change over time, they can be eye blinking um, for a period of time and then several years later develop a vocal tick. Um, so you can have both um, motor and or uh, vocal tics. So motor is you're having a movement of a body part. Uh, vocal tics is you can hear it verbally, like someone's making noises. Some examples are eye blinking, sh uh, shoulder shrugging, grunting, throat clearing. Um, we have a couple um, great op options here. We have clonidine or guanfacine. Um, those can be modest in benefit. And then we have, again, the same category you saw on the last slide, these neuroleptics. Um, so again, if someone's having more mood and behavior and then these tics, you can do both. One thing I wanna say is sometimes telling between myoclonus and tics can be a little bit challenging. So you wanna take time to kind of really understand what we call the phenomenology. What does it look like and behave like and what body parts is it affecting and how does it evolve over time because the treatments are very different for each of them. Um, we have um, a young individual that has this, a truncal myoclonus, but because the movement happens kind of in the trunk, the, the following movement is a little bit slower. And so we were thinking ticks and then we realized um, that it was myoclonus and we kind of shifted. So you just want to give it time and I, th I, I think it's great to stay humble and always reassess, right? Let's look at this again. What could this, may this be? So treatment of memory, we don't have a perfect pill for this, but we can provide a, an environment in which you can best um, thrive. So you know, we, the HD brain in general and JOHD likes a predictable environment. So you wanna make sure that the environment is stable. I understand that this is easier said than done. Life is beautifully chaotic. When people ask me how am I doing, I've got a four-year-old and an eight-year-old at home, right? So it's beautifully chaotic. You can do your best to keep things as controlled as possible, but allow yourself some grace and it's not gonna be perfect, okay? 
So as best as you can, make sure you're on a routine schedule. They know what's happening Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday. They know what time they're waking up and going to bed. They know what day they're going to speech therapy. Things are written out on a calendar. And if there's an event coming up that is unexpected, you need to be talking about it for a while, all right? Laying down the groundwork. So create that daily schedule. Try to minimize distractions and noises. They're very distracting, it's very difficult. So having the radio on over here and the TV on over there and the dogs yapping in the back um, and your three-year-old son is running over here. Just, again, minimize what you can. Um, try to simplify tasks and decisions. Not, do you want A, B, C, D, or E for dinner? Do you want A or B? Okay, simplify it. Um, reorient, if that's okay. Oh, remember we were going this way to do this. Um, be creative with your reminders, right? These are kiddos, they love stickers, sticky notes, right? You can put them everywhere, get colorful pens. Be creative about it, right? Meet them where they're at. Uh, modifications at school, so that's called an individual education plan. Oftentimes we'll have our social worker meet with schools um, and do in-services, teach the, the teachers and the staff about JOHD highlight their unique um, characteristics about it and what they can best do to get this individual to stay in school, stay engaged in social um, activities, um, but set them up for success, like clear achievables and expectations. And you can do that by pairing and collaborating. Um, treatment options for mood, again, kind of understanding, you know, what is the what part of this is the disease versus the psychological stress of the disease. We can treat depression, anxiety. Um, we have wonderful options of uh, antidepressants in many different categories. And here's some common ones that people use. Zoloft, Celexa, Fexor, Welbutrin, Remeron. They all have unique properties to them. Um, this one's a little bit more activating if there's an attention deficit. Uh, there, this one is, um, can be used for sleep at night too. So um, it just depends on that individual. All right, you hear a common theme there. So, you know, talk to your provider about which one might be best for your loved one. Uh, behaviorals uh, can be un un unpredictable and difficult to manage. Is this the disease or is, are you just being 13? Right, like it's tough. Remember being a teenager? Those are tough years. Your hormones are all over the place. You don't know what's going on. So again, is this the disease or are they just kind of going through natural experiences? Is there something at school that's happening, prompting it? Is it an environmental thing, right? So thinking about that. Again, in service with a social worker, um, with aggressiveness, sort of these hyperactive behavioral changes, impulsivity, explosive um, behavior, we wanna make sure, A, that we're modifying the environment as best as we can, making sure we minimize triggers or provokers. Um, and if there is some aggression there, you need to come up with a safety plan. These are hard topics to talk about, but you gotta talk about it. You gotta be the safe space to bring these up and allow people to talk about it. Um, obsessive thinking, again, reinsurance, redirection, but there are medications. Those antidepressants are great for those. And psychosis, uh, hallucinations and delusions. So hallucinations are things that you see or hear that other people do not. Delusions are kind of like paranoid ideas, false beliefs. So those can be treated with the antipsychotic category as well. Uh, yeah, sorry, this clicker is very clicky happy. Um, seizures, so again, you wanna make sure you have appropriate workup. Uh, seizures warrant brain imaging. Um, you gotta make sure that there's not something there provoking the seizures outside of HD. Um, an EEG, which looks at your brainwave activities to figure out what potentially seizure type you have. Um, and possibly blood tests if it's appropriate. Um, there's many different types of seizures. Um, you wanna talk about seizure precautions, which means if you have a seizure, what do you do about it, right? You don't, you don't hold on to them, you don't stick your fingers in their mouth, you, there's certain ways to manage that. So you wanna make sure that you know when, in the event of a seizure, what do I do? Um, we gotta make sure that we choose the right medication depending on the seizure, medica the seizure type. So different seizure types are treated differently. So just a list of some of these here, um, Keppra, Depakote, Lamictal, some of these are really good mood stabilizers too, so they might be used for mood and seizures. So again, different properties, thank you. Um, other symptoms to address, um, if there's sleep problems, good hygiene, medications if appropriate, Pain, you gotta treat pain, right? 
Um, make sure that you understand what's driving the pain and treat it accordingly, but some of these kiddos have to be on pain medications. Uh, constipation, you can see a whole list here for constipation. Um, and sometimes people are on a lot of these because you want to make because sure, being constipated is uncomfortable, right? And it makes everything feel worse. You can't sleep. You don't feel like eating. Um, and then there's this kind of unique symptom in, in, in JOHD, and I've heard it in HD too, that I don't think we completely understand, but this, that's what called the HD itch in the community, where people feel itchy on their skin. And it's pretty, it's more prominent in JOHD. And oftentimes we'll use gabapentin, which is a kind of a nerve pain pill that helps with that, or one of the antidepressants that treats nerve pain and, and mood. Um, other medical issues to address, you've got to address choking, um, making sure that you're taking small, slow bites, talk about whether a feeding tube is in line with your goals of care, talk about nutrition and making sure we can keep up with the calories. Communication, we've got to keep our kiddos communicating as it becomes more and more difficult. We have to substitute that out with fun communication um, devices that they can use oftentimes with pictures to kind of share with us what they're experiencing. You want to keep that communication open. We have lots of tips for additional resources. You can have adaptive clothing, like uh, Cat and Jack at Target, which is not too expensive, has adaptive clothing. Um, these Kizik shoes where they're built in the back that you can just put your heel in, you don't have to tie up shoes. Um, there's camps for kids with special needs and there's different adaptive equipment here, which there's many out there, but you have liftwear, you have Rift on adaptive tricycle here. The Xbox actually has an adaptive controller. Um, and then there's medical kind of equipment that can help there. But knowing these resources is really helpful um, to access. Here's just some pictures of these. Um, this is that Xbox one, which I thought was super cool. I didn't. My husband made that one. Oh, really? Oh no, I, I, I like discovered this like a, for another talk this last year. I'm like, that's wickedly cool. I love it. <laughs> hey, that's cool. Um, late stage as of JOHD, um, you wanna have early discussions about goals of care. What do we wanna look like across the spectrum of our journey with JOHD? You wanna make sure that um, you're treating discomfort. Um, you wanna be particularly t uh, t t paying attention to nutrition. You want to make sure there's services coming into the home and or a discussion about placement outside of the home. These are sensitive issues, but you want to talk about feeding tube, goals of care, palliative care, and hospice. These are services to help your journey, okay? And I know these are topics that are coming up more and more often at these talks, so appreciate that. This is an example of a 19-year-old who has late stage. Um, she got the disease at six years of age and um, she has 82 CAG repeats. Um, she's had bradykinesia, rigidity, impaired um, speech, and seizures. She was having, um, she had a, a G2 placed for not able to keep up with her um, nutritional needs. She had had her course um, complicated by um, skin breakdown, which healed. Um, she was getting Botox for, um, for tightness and stiffness. Um, she has an incredible family, but this was her list of medications. So as I said, you can see quite a few for the dystonia. She's on all the way up to morphine for chronic pain, and medications for seizures, and four for constipation. So it can be a lot, but the goal of this is to provide as much quality um, um, of life that we can. Caregivers. You can do anything but not everything. Take care of yourself. To be a caregiver in the long run, you have to pay attention to yourself. So make sure that you're managing your own feelings, you're getting respite, you have your support team, create your HD family. And not everything has to be about JOHD. Attempt to take a pause, live in the moment, and have it not be about JOHD. Paint your toes, I fly fish, get out in the water, meditate, whatever that is for you, manage it for you. So make sure that you're taking care of your physical and mental health, you're developing coping strategies, and that you're empowering yourself with self-value, self-care. You're not living with a secret. You have this community. You are that HD warrior already. Sometimes we just have to be reminded. 
There's lots of resources for J uniquely for JOHD. I've listed them here. Um, Help for HD has a high focus on JOHD. They'll do a, a October meeting in Washington, D.C. There's lots of research focusing on JOHD now and great um, youth um, organizations, as you saw last night, my favorite event. Thank you for all of your attention, and thank you especially to our JOHD and HD patients for your strength, courage, and inspiration. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions either to the whole room, um, or you just can come up afterwards if you want to ask me individually. Or feel free to go get some water and have a bio break before the next session. All right, well, yeah, please. Say it again. We, we have, um, yeah, so that's very similar to baclofen, yeah. So some people, they're not that different from one another. So yeah. She asked if we use uh, tizanidine, and that's a muscle relaxer like baclofen. So it's another option. All right. Well, I'll stick around. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>